Chapter Eighteen, Part One of the Voyage of the Beagle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Voyage of the Beagle by Charles Darwin. Chapter Eighteen, Part One. Tahiti and New Zealand. Pass through the Low Archipelago. Tahiti. Aspect. Vegetation on the mountains. View of Aimeo, Excursion into the Interior, Profound Ravines, Succession of Waterfalls, Number of Wild Useful Plants, Temperance of the Inhabitants, Their Moral State, Parliament Convened, New Zealand, Bay of Islands, Hippas, Excursion to Waimati, Missionary Establishment, English Weeds Now Run Wild, Waiomeo, Funeral of a New Zealand Woman, Sail for Australia. October 20th. The survey of the Galapagos archipelago being concluded, we steered towards Tahiti and commenced our long passage of 3,200 miles. In the course of a few days we sailed out of the gloomy and clouded ocean district which extends during the winter far from the coast of South America. We then enjoyed bright and clear weather, while running pleasantly along at the rate of 150 or 160 miles a day before the steady trade wind. The temperature in this more central part of the Pacific is higher than near the American shore. The thermometer in the poop cabin, by day and night, ranged between 80 and 83 degrees, which feels very pleasant, but with one degree or two higher the heat becomes oppressive. We passed through the low or dangerous archipelago, and saw several of those most curious rings of coral land, just rising above the water's edge, which have been called lagoon islands. A long and brilliantly white beach is capped by a margin of green vegetation, and the strip, looking either way, rapidly narrows away in the distance, and sinks beneath the horizon. From the masthead a wide expanse of smooth water can be seen within the ring. These low, hollow coral islands bear no proportion to the vast ocean out of which they abruptly rise, and it seems wonderful that such weak invaders are not overwhelmed by the all-powerful and never-tiring waves of that great sea, miscalled the Pacific. November 15th. At daylight, Tahiti, an island which must forever remain classical to the voyager in the South Sea, was in view. At a distance the appearance was not attractive. The luxuriant vegetation of the lower part could not yet be seen, and as the clouds rolled past, the wildest and most precipitous peaks showed themselves towards the center of the island. As soon as we anchored in Matave Bay, we were surrounded by canoes. This was our Sunday, but the Monday of Tahiti. If the case had been reversed, we should not have received a single visit, for the injunction not to launch a canoe on the Sabbath is rigidly obeyed. After dinner we landed to enjoy all the delights produced by the first impressions of a new country, and that country the charming Tahiti. A crowd of men, women, and children was collected on the memorable Point Venus, ready to receive us with laughing, merry faces. They marshaled us towards the house of Mr. Wilson, the missionary of the district, who met us on the road and gave us a very friendly reception. After sitting a very short time in his house, we separated to walk about, but returned there in the evening. The land capable of cultivation is scarcely in any part more than a fringe of low alluvial soil, accumulated round the base of the mountains, and protected from the waves of the sea by a coral reef, which encircles the entire line of coast. Within the reef there is an expanse of smooth water, like that of a lake, where the canoes of the natives can ply with safety, and where ships anchor. The low land, which comes down to the beach of coral sand, is covered by the most beautiful productions of the intertropical regions. In the midst of bananas, orange, coconut, and breadfruit trees, spots are cleared where yams, sweet potatoes, and sugar cane, and pineapples are cultivated. Even the brushwood is an imported fruit tree, namely the guava, which from its abundance has become as noxious as a weed. In Brazil I have often admired the varied beauty of the bananas, palms, and orange trees contrasted together, and here we also have the breadfruit, conspicuous from its large, glossy, and deeply digitated leaf. It is admirable to behold groves of a tree sending forth its branches with the vigor of an English oak, loaded with large and most nutritious fruit. However seldom the usefulness of an object can account for the pleasure of beholding it, 
In the case of these beautiful woods, the knowledge of their high productiveness no doubt enters largely into the feeling of admiration. The little winding paths, cool from the surrounding shade, led to the scattered houses, the owners of which everywhere gave us a cheerful and most hospitable reception. I was pleased with nothing so much as with the inhabitants. There is a mildness in the expression of their countenances which at once banishes the idea of a savage, and intelligence which shows that they are advancing in civilization. The common people, when working, keep the upper part of their bodies quite naked, and it is then that the Tahitians are seen to advantage. They are very tall, broad-shouldered, athletic, and well-proportioned. It has been remarked that it requires little habit to make a dark skin more pleasing and natural to the eye of a European than his own color. A white man bathing by the side of a Tahitian was like a plant bleached by the gardener's art, compared with a fine, dark green one growing vigorously in the open fields. Most of the men are tattooed, and the ornaments follow the curvature of the body so gracefully that they have a very elegant effect. One common pattern, varying in its details, is somewhat like the crown of a palm tree. It springs from the central line of the back, and gracefully curls round both sides. The simile may be a fanciful one, but I thought the body of a man thus ornamented was like the trunk of a noble tree embraced by a delicate creeper. Many of the elder people had their feet covered with small figures, so placed as to resemble a sock. This fashion, however, is partly gone by, and has been succeeded by others. Here, although fashion is far from immutable, every one must abide by that prevailing in his youth. An old man has thus his age forever stamped on his body, and he cannot assume the airs of a young dandy. The women are tattooed in the same manner as the men, and very commonly on their fingers. One unbecoming fashion is now almost universal, namely, shaving the hair from the upper part of the head, in a circular form, so as to leave only an outer ring. The missionaries have tried to persuade the people to change this habit, but it is the fashion, and that is a sufficient answer at Tahiti as well as at Paris. I was much disappointed in the personal appearance of the women. They are far inferior in every respect to the men. The custom of wearing a white or scarlet flower in the back of the head, or through a small hole in each ear, is pretty. A crown of woven coconut leaves is also worn as a shade for the eyes. The women appear to be in greater want of some becoming costume even than the men. Nearly all the natives understand a little English, that is, they know the names of common things, and by the aid of this, together with signs, a lame sort of conversation could be carried on. In returning in the evening to the boat, we stopped to witness a very pretty scene. Numbers of children were playing on the beach, and had lighted bonfires which illumined the placid sea and surrounding trees. Others in circles were singing Tahitian verses. We seated ourselves on the sand and joined their party. The songs were impromptu, and I believe related to our arrival. One little girl sang a line, which the rest took up in parts, forming a very pretty chorus. The whole scene made us unequivocally aware that we were seated on the shores of an island in the far-famed South Sea. 17th. This day is reckoned in the log-book as Tuesday the 17th, instead of Monday the 16th, owing to our, so far, successful chase of the sun. Before breakfast the ship was hemmed in by a flotilla of canoes, and when the natives were allowed to come on board, I suppose there could not have been less than two hundred. It was the opinion of every one that it would have been difficult to have picked out an equal number from any other nation who would have given so little trouble. Everybody brought something for sale. Shells were the main articles of trade. The Tahitians now fully understand the value of money, and prefer it to old clothes or other articles. The various coins, however, of English and Spanish denomination puzzle them, and they never seem to think the small silver quite secure until changed into dollars. Some of the chiefs have accumulated considerable sums of money. One chief, not long since, offered eight hundred dollars, about a hundred and sixty pounds sterling, for a small vessel, and frequently they purchase whale-boats and horses at the rate of from fifty to one hundred dollars. After breakfast I went on shore, and ascended the nearest slope, to a height of between two and three thousand feet. The outer mountains are smooth and conical, but steep, and the old volcanic rocks, of which they are formed, have been cut through by many profound ravines, diverging from the central broken parts of the island to the coast. 
Having crossed the narrow, low girt of inhabited and fertile land, I followed the smooth, steep ridge between two of the deep ravines. The vegetation was singular, consisting almost exclusively of small dwarf ferns, mingled higher up, with coarse grass. It was not very dissimilar from that on some of the Welsh hills, and this so close above the orchard of tropical plants on the coast was very surprising. At the highest point, which I reached, trees again appeared. Of the three zones of comparative luxuriance, the lower one owes its moisture, and therefore fertility, to its flatness. For, being scarcely raised above the level of the sea, the water from the higher land drains away slowly. The intermediate zone does not, like the upper one, reach into a damp and cloudy atmosphere, and therefore remains sterile. The woods in the upper zone are very pretty, tree ferns replacing the coconuts on the coast. It must not, however, be supposed that these woods at all equal in splendor the forests of Brazil. The vast numbers of productions which characterize a continent cannot be expected to occur in an island. From the highest point which I attained, there was a good view of the distant island of Aimeo, dependent on the same sovereign with Tahiti. On the lofty and broken pinnacles, white, massive clouds were piled up, which formed an island in the blue sky, as Aimeo itself did in the blue ocean. The island, with the exception of one small gateway, is completely encircled by a reef. At this distance, a narrow but well-defined, brilliantly white line was alone visible, where the waves first encountered the wall of Carl. The mountains rose abruptly out of the glassy expanse of the lagoon, included within this narrow white line, outside which the heaving waters of the ocean were dark-colored. The view was striking. It may aptly be compared to a framed engraving, where the frame represents the breakers, the marginal paper the smooth lagoon, and the drawing the island itself. When in the evening I descended from the mountain, a man, whom I had pleased with a trifling gift, met me, bringing with him hot roasted bananas, a pineapple, and coconuts. After walking under a burning sun, I do not know anything more delicious than the milk of a young coconut. Pineapples are here so abundant that the people eat them in the same wasteful manner as we might turnips. They are of an excellent flavor, perhaps even better than those cultivated in England, and this, I believe, is the highest compliment which can be paid to any fruit. Before going on board, Mr. Wilson interpreted for me to the Tahitian who had paid me so adroit an attention that I wanted him and another man to accompany me on a short excursion into the mountains. Eighteenth. In the morning I came on shore early, bringing with me some provisions in a bag, and two blankets for myself and servant. These were lashed to each end of a long pole, which was alternately carried by my Tahitian companions on their shoulders. These men are accustomed thus to carry, for a whole day, as much as fifty pounds at each end of their poles. I told my guides to provide themselves with food and clothing, but they said that there was plenty of food in the mountains, and for clothing that their skins were sufficient. Our line of march was in the valley of Tiaru, down which a river flows into the sea by Point Venus. This is one of the principal streams in the island, and its source lies at the base of the loftiest central pinnacles, which rise to a height of about seven thousand feet. The whole island is so mountainous that the only way to penetrate into the interior is to follow up the valleys. Our road, at first, lay through woods which bordered each side of the river and the glimpses of the lofty central peaks, seen as through an avenue, with here and there a waving coconut tree on one side, were extremely picturesque. The valley soon began to narrow, and the sides to grow lofty and more precipitous. After having walked between three and four hours, we found the width of the ravine scarcely exceeded that of the bed of the stream. On each hand the walls were nearly vertical, yet from the soft nature of the volcanic strata, trees, and a rank vegetation sprung from every projecting ledge. These precipices must have been some thousand feet high, and the whole formed a mountain gorge far more magnificent than anything which I had ever before beheld. Until the midday sun stood vertically over the ravine, the air felt cool and damp, but now it became very sultry. Shaded by a ledge of rock, beneath a façade of columnar lava, we ate our dinner. My guides had already procured a dish of small fish and fresh-water prawns. They carried with them a small net stretched on a hoop, and where the water was deep and in eddies, they dived, and like otters, with their eyes open, followed the fish into holes and corners, and thus caught them. The Tahitians have the dexterity of amphibious animals in the water. 
An anecdote mentioned by Ellis shows how much they feel at home in this element. When a horse was landing for Pomar in 1817, the slings broke, and it fell into the water. Immediately the natives jumped overboard, and by their cries and vain efforts at assistance, almost drowned it. As soon, however, as it reached the shore, the whole population took to flight, and tried to hide themselves from the man-carrying pig, as they christened the horse. A little higher up, the river divided itself into three little streams. The two northern ones were impracticable, owing to a succession of waterfalls which descended from the jagged summit of the highest mountain. The other, to all appearance, was equally inaccessible, but we managed to ascend it by a most extraordinary road. The sides of the valley were here nearly precipitous, but, as frequently happens with stratified rocks, small ledges projected, which were thickly covered by wild bananas, liliaceous plants, and other luxuriant productions of the tropics. The Tahitians, by climbing amongst these ledges, searching for fruit, had discovered a track by which the whole precipice could be scaled. The first ascent from the valley was very dangerous, for it was necessary to pass a steeply inclined face of naked rock by the aid of ropes which we brought with us. How any person discovered that this formidable spot was the only point where the side of the mountain was practicable, I cannot imagine. We then cautiously walked along one of the ledges till we came to one of the three streams. This ledge formed a flat spot, above which a beautiful cascade, some hundred feet in height, poured down its waters, and beneath another high cascade fell into the main stream in the valley below. From this cool and shady recess we made a circuit to avoid the overhanging waterfall. As before, we followed little projecting ledges, the danger being partly concealed by the thickness of the vegetation. In passing from one of the ledges to another, there was a vertical wall of rock. One of the Tahitians, a fine, active man, placed the trunk of a tree against this, climbed up it, and then, by the aid of crevices, reached the summit. He fixed the ropes to a projecting point, and lowered them for our dog and luggage, and then we clambered up ourselves. Beneath the ledge on which the dead tree was placed, the precipice must have been five or six hundred feet deep and if the abyss had not been partially concealed by the overhanging ferns and lilies, my head would have turned giddy, and nothing should have induced me to attempt it. We continued to ascend, sometimes along ledges, and sometimes along knife-edged ridges, having on each hand profound ravines. In the Cordillera I have seen mountains on a far grander scale, but for abruptness nothing at all comparable with this. In the evening we reached a flat little spot on the banks of the same stream, which we had continued to follow, and which descends in a chain of waterfalls. Here we bivouacked for the night. On each side of the ravine there were great beds of the mountain banana, covered with ripe fruit. Many of these plants were from twenty to twenty-five feet high, and from three to four in circumference. By the aid of strips of bark for rope, the stems of bamboos for rafters, and the large leaf of the banana for a thatch, the Tahitians, in a few minutes, built us an excellent house, and, with withered leaves, made a soft bed. They then proceeded to make a fire and cook our evening meal. A light was procured by rubbing a blunt, pointed stick in a groove made in another, as if with intention of deepening it, until by the friction the dust became ignited. A peculiarly white and very light wood, the hibiscus tiliarius, is alone used for this purpose. It is the same which serves for poles to carry any burden, and for the floating outriggers to their canoes. The fire was produced in a few seconds, but to a person who does not understand the art, it requires, as I found, the greatest exertion. But at last, to my great pride, I succeeded in igniting the dust. The gaucho in the pampas uses a different method. Taking an elastic stick about eighteen inches long, he presses one end on his breast, and the other pointed end into a hole in a piece of wood and then rapidly turns the curved part, like a carpenter's center bit. The Tahitians, having made a small fire of sticks, placed a score of stones, of about the size of cricket balls, on the burning wood. In about ten minutes the sticks were consumed, and the stones hot. They had previously folded up in small parcels of leaves, pieces of beef, fish, ripe and unripe bananas, and the tops of the wild arum. These green parcels were laid in a layer between two layers of the hot stones, and the whole then covered up with earth, so that no smoke or steam could escape. In about a quarter of an hour the whole was most deliciously cooked. 
The choice green parcels were now laid on a cloth of banana leaves, and with a coconut shell we drank the cool water of the running stream, and thus we enjoyed our rustic meal. I could not look on the surrounding plants without admiration. On every side were forests of banana, the fruit of which, though serving for food in various ways, lay in heaps decaying on the ground. In front of us there was an extensive break of wild sugar-cane, and the stream was shaded by the dark green knotted stem of the ava, so famous in former days for its powerful intoxicating effects. I chewed a piece, and found that it had an acrid and unpleasant taste, which would have induced any one at once to have pronounced it poisonous. Thanks to the missionaries, this plant now thrives only in these deep ravines, innocuous to every one. Close by I saw the wild arum, the roots of which, when well baked, are good to eat, and the young leaves better than spinach. There was the wild yam, an aliliaceous plant called tea, which grows in abundance, and has a soft brown root, in shape and size like a huge log of wood. This served us for dessert, for it is as sweet as treacle, and with a pleasant taste. There were, moreover, several other wild fruits, and useful vegetables. The little stream, besides its cool water, produced eels and crayfish. I did indeed admire this scene, when I compared it with an uncultivated one in the temperate zones. I felt the force of the remark that man, at least savage man, with his reasoning powers only partly developed, is the child of the tropics. As the evening drew to a close, I strolled beneath the gloomy shade of the bananas up the course of the stream. My walk was soon brought to a close by coming to a waterfall between two and three hundred feet high, and again above this there was another. I mention all these waterfalls in this one brook to give a general idea of the inclination of the land. In the little recess where the water fell, it did not appear that a breath of wind had ever blown. The thin edges of the great leaves of the banana, damp with spray, were unbroken, instead of being, as is so generally the case, split into a thousand shreds. From our position, almost suspended on the mountainside, there were glimpses into the depths of the neighboring valleys, and the lofty points of the central mountains, towering up within sixty degrees of the zenith, hid half the evening sky. Thus seated, it was a sublime spectacle to watch the shades of night gradually obscuring the last and highest pinnacles. Before we laid ourselves down to sleep, the elder Tahitian fell on his knees, and with closed eyes repeated a long prayer in his native tongue. He prayed as a Christian should do, with fitting reverence, and without the fear of ridicule or any ostentation of piety. At our meals neither of the men would taste food without saying beforehand a short grace. Those travellers who think that a Tahitian prays only when the eyes of the missionary are fixed on him should have slept with us that night on the mountainside. Before morning it rained very heavily, but the good thatch of banana leaves kept us dry. End of chapter 18, part 1